Uh, but it's good to see you all and good to see everyone here. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, and also just welcome. Welcome to worship here at First Universalist Church. Uh, this morning we have quite the service for you and I am so excited to get to share some of uh, what we've been working on this week. But first, before we get started, let's just settle into our chairs wherever you are, settle into wherever you are, if you're in a chair or not, um, as we just start our worship service. So let's take a deep breath together in and out as we enjoy our prelude from our fabulous music director, Breck Chesvold. Good morning and welcome to the First Universalist Church of Rochester, where we are called to nurture the spirit and to serve the community. Wherever you come from, we welcome you. Whoever you are, we welcome you. Whomever you love, we welcome you. Whatever your relationship to your own body, to your own flesh and blood, this vessel that carries you, we welcome you here this morning. We welcome all of you. It is good, it is good, it is good to be together this morning. 
If you are here for the first time or the second time or the third time, we especially welcome you. Thank you so much for making your way to our online virtual sacred space. There is a link in the chat right now to a visitor's form that you can fill out at your own convenience. We'd love to be able to have an opportunity to welcome you beyond this space. As we gather this morning and as some have already been doing, we wanna invite you to pop into the chat and to offer a greeting. A hello, a how are you, a happy Valentine's Day, all, you know, whatever feels appropriate. Just go, go ahead and let us know that you are here. We're so glad that you are here this morning. Welcome, welcome to worship at First Universalist. Our opening hymn this morning in line with our theme and in line with this day is What Wondrous Love, hymn number 18. So let us join hearts and voices in singing together this morning, recognizing that even as we are singing muted in our own homes, we are creating a song across our city of Rochester, the country and the world. So let us sing together hymn number 18, What Wondrous Love. As the issue of generations of Protestants, I have inherited a certain alienation from the body. My ancestors revered the Bible, but they sort of ignored the Song of Songs with its passionate sexual imagery. And in our churches today, we sing Rumi's beautiful words, come, come, whoever you are. But we forget how his poems so often conflate earthly passion with love of the divine. Through you, the soil turns into flesh and flesh then comes to think and speak. Through words and thought, the hidden realm becomes pregnant with countless forms. Over the past two generations, feminist theologians have begun to bring us back into a more embodied, holistic understanding of the sacred. Clarissa Pinkola Estes acknowledges that, quote, some say the soul informs the body, but what, she asks, 
if we were to imagine for a moment that the body informs the soul, helps it adapt to mundane life, parses, translates, gives the blank page the ink and the pen with which the soul can write upon our lives. Suppose, as in fairy tales of the shape changers, the body is a god in its own right, a teacher, a mentor, a certified guide. Then what? This is a growing edge for me, a place where I barely know how much I do not know. It is a place perhaps where all of us can grow and when better than Valentine's Day. Come, let us worship together. Those of us who revere the mind and spirit too often want a flame without oil or wax or even the chalice itself. As the chalice gives birth to the flame, our bodies give birth to the whole of human experience, pleasure and pain, sorrow and joy, youth and age, toil and rest, passion and contentment, connection, experience, and a flickering out at the end. May we be open to it all. As Reverend Lane lights our chalice at First Universalist, and as many of us light our own at home, I ask you to join with me in our words of chalice lighting said together in unison. May we be a people of welcome here to grow in heart and mind and spirit. And may we reach out to serve our community. Please join now in our affirmation of faith followed by the doxology. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the source and meaning of life. Thus do we covenant with each other and with all. friends say the church is the body of Christ, by which they mean that all the pieces matter, that the sum is more than the parts, that the Holy Spirit animates us all, that everyone belongs and everyone contributes. While we cannot be together as one body in this time of isolation, still the metaphor holds. The church continues its mission and ministries our mission and ministries continue, and we support them to the best of our abilities. Please copy and paste the link that you will find in the chat window to make a financial contribution online to the First Universalist Church, or feel free to send a check in the physical mail.
Good morning, friends. Today's story is Lovely by Jess Hong. What is lovely? Lovely is different. Black, white, tall, short, lovely, simple, complex, fluffy, sleek, lovely, soft, sharp, big, small, lovely, fancy, sporty, graceful, stompy, lovely, Lovely is different, weird, and wonderful. Lovely is you. Lovely is me. We are all lovely. If you are like me, you may be missing getting to see some of our kids on Sunday morning. And uh, our fabulous Minister of Lifespan Faith Development, Reverend Michelle Yates, um, whose voice you just heard, has invited some of our families to send in some videos of our kids doing some body tricks uh, for this month of February for the theme of embodiment. So this Sunday, I'm actually going to share a video from our fabulous Walter Yates. And then next Sunday, we'll get to see a body trick from the wonderful Caitlin Reynolds. So today, you are going to get to see Walter getting to dance to um, a song that gives you some instructions for what to do with your body. If you want to just watch or if you want to join in, go ahead. But it's just a delight to get to see our children and to learn from them about what it means to be embodied human beings. So let us join in learning from Walter Yates the things we can do to be embodied human beings. Ready? Bounce. You can bounce with your body. Freeze. Say dance. Dance. Dancing, dancing all around. Dancing, dancing, dancing. Dancing everywhere you please. But stop when I say freeze. What's still? Everybody. Get ready. Hopping, hopping all around. Hopping, hopping, hopping. Hopping everywhere you please. My but stop when you say freeze. Hold still. Hold still. Skip. Skipping, skipping all around. Good try. Skipping, skipping. Skipping, skipping, skipping everywhere you please. Mom, but stop when I mom. say freeze. All right, what's next? Twirl, twirling, twirling all around. Twirling, 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 twirling everywhere you please. But stop. When I say, oh, you get dizzy, freeze, hold still. Last one. <gasps> dancing, dancing all around. Dancing, dancing, dancing. I'm doing that, Mom. Dancing. You are doing it, yes. Look at all the awesome things you can do with your body. Freeze. <gasps> 
Good job. Yay. Good dancing. What a delight that child is and how big he has grown since the last time we were together. Dear ones, I invite you into this reverent time of sharing in the joys and the sorrows of our gathered community. If you would like to, you can place a hand over your heart to be able to listen from this heart-centered place. And as I place stones into the bowl, I will read aloud the joys and the sorrows of our gathered community. All are invited to share your joys and your sorrows in the chat um, that we may hear from the community gathered here. So we begin our joys and sorrows this morning with a joy from Lois and Greg Baum. Today, Lois and Greg Baum are celebrating our 26th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary to you both. I have a joy also from Marty Eggers. My grandson, Benjamin Kumo, a junior at Brighton High School, finished second in giant slalom and first in slalom at the Section 5 Alpine Finals at Swain this past week. There were approximately 80 competitors, so wonderful. We are celebrating with you, Marty, and with Benjamin. A joy from Steve Searles, my daughter and her fiance are buying their first home on Tuesday. Oh my goodness, we will certainly be thinking of you, Steve, and thinking of her. Wow, what a big milestone. Um, a joy from Emma Berry, our office administrator, that her grandmother has gotten her first COVID-19 vaccination shot and has her second one scheduled for March. Joining in that joy and that relief. Joyful from Marty McGuire and relieved that her son, Matt, was offered a full-time assistant teacher position. Oh my goodness, wonderful. Thinking of Matt and thinking of you, Marty. Um, uh, Connie Volk shares that her second cataract surgery was successful. Yay, so glad. We've had quite a few cataract surgeries in the congregation, so Connie, thinking of you. A joy from MJ Curry that her 81-year-old mother got her second vac vaccination this week, so we are now hoping I can visit her in March, joining you in some of the hope of what these vaccinations bring and thinking of her and thinking of you, MJ. Um, a joy from Julie Kleinhans, incredibly grateful to have been vaccinated. Wow, oh my goodness, we are just having a rash of vaccinations and I'm loving it, yay. <laughs> um, a joy this morning to hear Brock on the Hope Jones organ. A sorrow that so few GOP senators voted to convict the ex-president. I'm sure that sorrow is shared. A joy to be recovered from COVID from Alex Pita and Chelsea Hunt. We are so glad you both recovered. We have been thinking of you, praying for you, meditating for you, whatever is welcome. So, so glad to hear that. Yay. Um, a sorrow uh, from Cheryl Dunbar, her sister and family oh, all have COVID. And she and her son are sick. The other two are positive but asymptomatic. Cheryl, we are thinking of you and your family. Um, and just thinking of your sister and her son. <sighs> what a time. What a time. So I will drop. Oh, nope. 
a joy uh, from Emma Berry that her partner and she managed to surprise each other over Valentine's this morning, even though they both work from home. This is a challenging year to surprise one another for Valentine's Day. <laughs> so if, if you're looking to surprise somebody, let this be your inspiration. <laughs> it can be done. I will, I will drop one final stone into the bowl to represent all of the joys and sorrows left unspoken in, our, uh, in the silent sanctuaries of our hearts and in this virtual sacred space, recognizing that we are a people who hold multitudes, who are always holding joy and sorrow. May all, may all, may all be held in the heart of love. Today, this morning, as we do uh, each Sunday now, we light a white candle to acknowledge that we are a congregation and a community that is living through a pandemic that is vitally and vibrantly connecting, but whose lives are also stricken by grief, relief, worry, anguish, who are also holding the hope of recovery, healing, vaccination. We are a people who are living with the multitudes of this pandemic and of this disease. May this candle's flame be a beacon of hope and a reminder that we are not alone. Amen. So dear ones, as we settle in today for our pastoral prayer, it's actually more of a meditation this morning. So I'm gonna invite you to just enter into a moment of meditation with one another. So get comfortable or as comfortable as you can, as we are going to sort of be reaching within and listening within. Sit back in your chair, notice how your feet are placed and whether or not it's actually comfortable for you. Um, if you would like, you can even, you know, lie down, keep your camera on or turn it off, if that's gonna really help you to relax in uh, to our meditation this morning. I think especially during this month when we were exploring embodiment, Let's be as comfortable as we can while we are meditating together. The piece that is just the most important is that you can be present with your body. Give your body what it needs to be comfortable. So if you would like to close your eyes or soften your gaze as feels appropriate to you, I'll just invite you to just get in touch with the rhythm of your breath. to just listen to that life force that is here residing in your chest and in your lungs and in your belly. Just listen to it for a moment. And as you are here listening to your breath, I wanna invite you to just think through the events that are to come in this day. What comes next after this service? What are your plans? What do you hope to have happen or even just to get done? I wanna invite you to allow that trajectory of your day, that plan to kind of flow through your mind for a second here as if it were a movie that you were sitting back and watching. So let's just take a moment to let that day flow, to let this day flow through our minds. Within this consideration of what comes next, I invite you now to pause and to listen deep within. If you can get to that quiet, still place inside of you, that place that is neither looking ahead nor looking behind, but is right here, right now. Get still and quiet and listen to what your guts are telling you. What do you want? What do you desire?
What do you truly want to do guided by this inner knowing? Make space for it inside you. No thought is too frivolous. Allow the desire to just be. Do not talk yourself out of it. Do not ignore it. Just allow what you want to be within you. To fill you up. Let us give gratitude this morning for the desires of our bodies and our hearts. We are thankful for this deeper knowing, this gut instinct. We commit this morning to honoring these desires more, to acting upon them, to truly listening to them, to possibly even giving them voice and saying, I want whatever it is. Let us embrace this practice in moments when a decision is before us, when we have a turning point in our days, a time when we know what is to come next, or so we think, and a way to just pause, go deep within, and listen. Let us embrace this practice in moments when we do not know what to do with ourselves. Let us hear the call of our bodies, our hearts, our minds, and let us know that it is sacred to answer. Amen. Blessed be, and may it be so. And as we enter into silence together this morning, let us continue to listen to and to reflect on the desires of our bodies, on the desires of our hearts, on the desires of our spirits. In this silence we share, may we take heart that we are sharing contemplative time across many contexts, sharing silence with those we know and love and those we have yet to meet in person, just met in this virtual sacred space. May this silence nourish us. Dear ones, as we return from our silence, let us join in our hymn of contemplation, hymn number 1009, Meditation on Breathing. 
reading this morning on this Valentine's Day is from a talk from Audre Lorde given in 1978 at Mount Holyoke College at the Berkshire Conference on the History of Women. The essay was published in 1988 and I first became familiar with it in Adrienne Marie Brown's book Pleasure Activism. For those of you unfamiliar with Audre Lorde, she describes herself as a black lesbian, mother, warrior, poet. Her writings are well known, especially Sister Outsider and Zami, A New Spelling of My Name. She is credited widely in black feminist circles. And this morning, we actually have the delight that technology has made available to us to hear an excerpt of her 1978 address, The Uses of the Erotic, the Erotic as Power, in her own voice. So I'm going to share that this morning with you all, just an excerpt. This is a 23 minute long essay and talk and um, we'll share it out on our Facebook page after this if folks are interested in hearing the whole thing. So let us join in listening to Audre Lorde's, the, uh, an excerpt from Audre Lorde's The Uses of the Erotic, The Erotic is Power. As women, we have often come to distrust that power which rises from our deepest and non-rational knowledge, because of course we have been warned against it all our lives by a male world which values this depth of feeling enough to keep women around in order to exercise it in their service, but which fears this same depth too much to examine the possibilities of it within themselves. So in this case, women are maintained at a distant and inferior position, psychically milked, much the same way that ants maintain colonies of aphids to provide a life-giving substance for the masters. But the erotic offers a well of replenishing and provocative force to any woman who does not fear its revelation, nor succumb to the belief that sensation is enough. The erotic has been misnamed and used against us. It has been made into the confused, the trivial, the psychotic, the pornographic, the plasticized sensation. And for this reason, we have often turned away from the exploration and consideration of the erotic as a source of power and information. We have confused it with the opposite, the pornographic. But pornography is a direct denial of the power of the erotic, for it represents the suppression of all true feeling. Pornography emphasizes sensation without feeling. And the erotic 
is a measure between the beginnings of our sense of self and the chaos and power of our deepest feelings. It is an internal sense of satisfaction to which once we have experienced it, we know we can aspire. Once having experienced the fullness of this depth of feeling and recognized its power, in honor and self-respect, we can require no less of ourselves. Now, it is never easy to demand the most from ourselves, from our lives, from our work. To go beyond the encouraged mediocrity of the society that we live in is always fraught with danger and with fear. And the function of the erotic is to encourage excellence. The function of the erotic is to encourage excellence and to give us the strength to pursue it. But giving in to the fear of feeling and working to capacity is a luxury that only the unintentional can afford. And by the unintentional, I mean those who, are, who do not wish to guide their own destinies. And I do not think that that, I hope, that does not speak to anyone here now. This internal requirement toward excellence, which we learn from the erotic, must not be misconstrued as demanding the impossible, either from ourselves or from others, because such a demand incapacitates everyone in the process. For the erotic is not a question of what we do alone. It is a question of how acutely, how fully we can feel in the doing. For once we know the extent to which we are capable of feeling that sense of satisfaction, that sense of fullness, that sense of completion, we can then observe which of our various life endeavors bring us closest to that fullness. So as I was thinking through this month of February, I thought I wanted to share Hajra Lord's words with you all back in January, as I was just thinking through the worship theme of this month. In reading her lecture, The Uses of the Erotic, the Erotic as Power, I found her words compelling. 
especially for us to explore on this Valentine's Day, this day dedicated to love. And yet, as I heard her speak these words, as I found this recording, and as this Sunday drew nearer, I began to get a little bit squeamish. Is this something we can actually talk about in church? Can we talk about the erotic from this place and space? Is it possible for us to explore the powers of the erotic as a spiritual community? I began to have my doubts as to what I was thinking leading up to this day. She mentions the pornographic Wow, and here we are, here we are this morning. And yet, I have to remind myself that we ground ourselves in the Unitarian Universalist tradition. Our Universalist ancestors were all about love. Sure, it was God's love, but our humanist roots call us to explore the love between human beings. And the erotic is surely a piece of that. It has to be. This power Audre Lorde speaks about is surely a piece of that. We are part of a denomination that has taken many risks to declare the sexual and the sensual, the embodied aspects of love as sacred. With our pioneering curricula about your sexuality, which was the curricula that I learned when I was in high school, that began in the 1960s, and has evolved in the present day to our whole lives, we are the bearers of one of the only consent-based sexuality education curricula in the country. Let that sink in for just a moment. There should be more about consent in our sexuality education curricula for all ages, not just for the curricula folks can access at church. We began teaching our teenagers that sexuality is sacred, that our bodies are sacred, and then realized we actually needed facts-based, consent-based sexuality education curricula for all ages. People of all ages need the reminder and the call that our sexuality is sacred, that our own inner sexual power, coupled with our consent and a deep inner knowing of what brings us pleasure, is an integral part of our shared humanity. Our erotic powers can be used to cause harm and to bring good about in the world. And I think this piece about consent has something to do with that. Without consent and without understandings of power, our sexual power has the capacity to dominate, to not ask permission, to be ultimately harmful and life-destroying rather than life-giving. The reclaiming of erotic power, healthy erotic power, and the way Audre Lorde speaks of power dynamics between men and women are surely integral to sacred sexuality. Of course, coming to us from this context of the late 1970s, coming to us from a time when awareness and options around gender identity were beginning to come into the consciousness of American culture, knowing that transgender and gender variant people have always been a part of humanity for as long as humanity has been around. What I hear her speaking to is this dynamic where power goes unacknowledged. What I hear her speaking to is that those who are historically oppressed and oppressed in the present day are encouraged to disconnect from their healthy erotic power in order that those in the dominant group might feel more comfortable. I wade into these waters of exploration of what Audre Lorde's essay has to say to us today with a bit of humility and affirmation, aforementioned trepidation, knowing that this is a foundational text to black feminist thought and I am a white woman. I want to acknowledge this from the outset because I don't intend today to argue with what Lord is saying, not to, nor to deconstruct her ideas for too long. That kind of deconstruction has meant plastering the values of white supremacy culture onto the thoughts, ideas, and experiences of black women. And my hope is not to do that kind of violence here with you all this Sunday morning. Rather, my hope is that we have space to learn from this powerful and prophetic essay 
to learn from Lord's aspirations and scholarship in this present day. Lord defines the erotic as a measure between the beginnings of our sense of self and the chaos of our strongest feelings. It is an internal sense of satisfaction to which once we have experienced it, we know we can aspire. For having experienced the fullness of this depth of feeling and recognizing its power in honor and self-respect, we can require no less of ourselves. I hear her talking about our deep inner yes here. I hear her talking about what brings us pleasure. What is an affirmation of a love of self? What power can be found when we honor that inner yes and seek relationships that also honor who we truly are alongside demanding respect for one another? And isn't that what love and the erotic should be about? The real, true humanity of us all, vulnerable, tender, the soul laid bare as we listen to what we as tr our true selves desire. I appreciate hearing from her this morning that so often women, and I would argue anyone with a femme gender expression, are encouraged to ignore the power within us, to tailor our lives for the pleasure of the dominant group, to ignore our wants and our knowings and our inner yes for ways to please others, to engage in an unequal partnership that often devalues us. At its very heart, feminism seeks an equality of all gender expressions. At its very heart, Lord is speaking a piece of truth many of us here would rather leave unspoken. And it is still a message for today. With all the progress that has been made, it is certainly still a message for today, especially in light of yesterday. In his book, The Gift of Fear, Gavin de Becker describes a situation that is likely familiar to so many of us. He describes a woman who is coming home late at night and is approached by a man who gives her the creeps. However, she does not want to be impolite. So she ignores those creeps, those fears that are often a gift until it is too late. The situation he describes ends in violence, but not all of these life scenarios do. Some do, not all. What I want to emphasize here is that there is power in that deep, non-rational knowing that resides in our guts. And I feel like many of us have been disempowered by ignoring that part of us, or even learning to switch it off in favor of being nice, being polite, and living within societal norms that keeps others around us more comfortable. Sometimes, oftentimes, at a risk to our own safety and at the loss of honoring what our bodies, what our hearts, what our minds have to tell us. To ignore those creeps and those fears about someone is to reject a gift our bodies are giving us. This knowing, this inner yes, and this inner no are both a gift. As we look towards this day, this February 14th, it only happens on a Sunday every seven years. I wonder whether or not the expression of Valentine's Day that we are encouraged to conform to are part of the pornographic, Lord describes. This plasticized expression of love contained in boxes of chocolate, flowers, and all sorts of stuff we are encouraged to buy for one another, seeking the sensation of knowing we are loved by these acts of devotion. What I hear her writing and speaking about is some sort of ideal we are given as to what the erotic and what love is supposed to look like that none of us, not one of us, are actually able to live up to. It boils love and the sensual down to sensations, surface level appearances, rather than going deep, rather than exploring where our very yes and no come from rather than honoring our bodies and our experiences, knowing our limitations and knowing the erotic at its very core is not about appearances, but rather about the messiness and often imperfect expression of our deepest desires. 
To me, love is not contained in bright red plastic hearts. It cannot be conveyed in candy or in bloom. Love at its most raw and real is the decision to stay together, the choice to be part of someone else's life. It is not just for romantic relationships in our lives, but also for family, also for friendships, also for kinship. And there are times when to love is difficult. There are times when we disagree about what love can look like. There are times when the desires of two or more parties do not match, when one person's disconnection from their own deep inner yes causes a rift in the relationship, when power goes unacknowledged and someone is asking for the emotional labor of another repeatedly without acknowledging, acknowledging the ask, making explicit their needs and actually seeing emotional labor as what it is, labor. Love is hard work. To remain in love is hard work, and I certainly turn to you all here in this virtual space who have been married or in some sort of committed partnerships for 20 years plus to get the amen on that. My marriage is still new. It's only been two years. <laughs> let us not allow the erotic, let us not allow our love to be commodified on this day. I'm not one to deny you your candies and your chocolates. Please do not mishear what I am saying. Get your bonbons. You better have those bonbons and candied hearts because they're delicious. <laughs> but let us not confuse these for an indication of love. Rather, let us listen to our bodies and honor what they are telling us. Let us listen inside to what our yes and our no is. Let us listen and no longer ignore when we hear no. It's hard, right? Because for some of us, love has looked like saying yes all the time. For some of us, love has been conveyed to us as blanket consent for another person to be who they want to be, to take what they need to take, to ask, and to receive from us. But I am here to tell you this morning that we cannot have a deep and truly consenting yes when we are saying yes to everything all of the time. To truly say yes to that which brings pleasure and satisfaction into our lives, we must also find out where our no is, where our boundaries lie, where we are no longer willing to give because we cannot. We are finite human beings after all, not designed to give and give and give without being restored, without also being in the deep interconnected relationship of giving and receiving. I am here this morning to tell you that your desires are sacred and that these desires must also be in covenant with responsibility, again, acknowledging power dynamics and the harm that our desires unchecked can cause. But your desires for pleasure, your desires for the erotic are sacred. These are sacred expressions of a deeper knowing a sacred expression of an embodied love, which can be life-giving, empowering, and a beautiful way to better get to self-love and self-respect. I encourage you this morning to pay attention to what gives you pleasure and what drains you. And I encourage you to check in with yourself about why you feel you deserve to stay in situations that drain you why you feel you deserve anything less than pleasure and joy and deep desire in this life. The power of the erotic, the power of love, the power of knowing ourselves fully and what we want, these are pathways towards more full-hearted living. May you find pleasure these days and in the days to come. May you embrace what fills your cup to the brim because you deserve it. We all deserve it. And may you recognize and realize this power, this honest and truthful power as your own and own it. Amen. Blessed be. May it be so. And happy Valentine's Day. Our final hymn this morning is hymn number 86. Blessed spirit of my life. We invite you to remain muted and sing out joyfully from home, again creating a collective song from wherever we find ourselves. Let us honor our life spirits this morning.
extinguish this flame both in our own homes and here in our sanctuary at First Universalist Church, I'll invite you to join me in a unison reading of our chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame, but we keep its light in our hearts with its message of love and justice, taking it outside these walls to the world we live in until we are together again. And friends, I'll invite you now to please turn your view to gallery view so that you may look upon the faces of those who are here gathering with us today. These amazing and wonderful faces and let us reach out and connect. If you are joining us on the phone, put a hand to your heart and think of someone that you love. Friends, as you go forth this day, may you know your power. May you know that your sexuality and your erotic power are sacred. May you honor your body, your desires, and your deep, deep, deep inner yes, as well as your deep, deep, deep inner no. May you go forth knowing that that is an expression of the love of this place, that that is an expression of the love of the Most High, of the divine, however you choose to define it. May you know that you are loved, and may you go forth and be that love to whomever you may meet or interact with this week. Let the people of the church say amen. And as we go forward today, dear ones, I will invite you to follow these benediction, this benediction with the words, I am claiming my power, because we want to hear it from y'all. And let us join in listening to our beautiful postlude prepared by our fabulous music director, Brock Cheswold. 